Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to our all-female worship team today. Just need to get a female drummer up there, and we'll be set. So, um, it was good to hear the reports of the ladies' retreat. Um, I'm just excited what God is doing in our our midst and, and amongst our ladies. And and thank you, Matt and Stephanie, for sharing uh, a little bit about perspectives. Um, I really do hope that over the next few weeks, as we talk about perspectives, that 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 it will motivate something in you to be a part of it. So uh, I had a chance to be a part of it as well, and I really do think it was one of those amazingly great eye-opening type classes. So as I said in the video, it's, it's 15, 16 weeks long, um, but it's just one day a week, uh, and you can invest in it as little or as much as you want. You can come and just listen, or you can come and read, and uh, but it'll change your life. So... Um, and you'll get to pray, so it's an exciting thing. So, uh, well, if you don't mind, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Romans chapter three. And today we're going to be looking at something that is just what I call all inclusive. This all inclusive reality. Um, that scripture talks about. So, but before we do, like, who doesn't like all inclusive things? Like, I mean, who, who likes all inclusive things? I do. I'll admit it. I am one of those guys who really enjoys going to the Golden Corral. You know, I know it's kind of rednecky, but, you know, the Golden Corral, one price, and you get chicken and steak and pasta. I don't know why anybody would waste their time with salad, but salad, I mean, you're paying for all that other stuff. Why fill, use your calories on salad, right? But then you get all the desserts. I mean, it's a great thing. I, I don't like taking, you know, I got a teenage son, but you would think you'd really get your price worth out of him, but he eats like a bird. But I get my money's worth, so it's okay. So, um, I like that. I've never been on one of those all-inclusive vacations. Has anybody done that? All-inclusive vacations? I've never done that, but it's something, you know, I wouldn't mind trying. You know, and, and if anybody's planning on going on one, you feel free to bring me along. Um, um, but, you know, uh, one of those, you pay one price, you get the hotel, the transportation, the, the food and the drinks and the entertainment and golf or whatever it is that kind of floats your boat there. Or maybe it's on a floating boat and you get to do it on a cruise. All-inclusive things are nice in most cases. And this is where we're going to look at in Romans chapter 3, that there is an all-inclusive reality that is really not so appealing. So we've been talking about it for a, a bit as we've been going through this series on Romans. Um, we've been talking about it in bits and pieces, but today is this this part where Paul kind of sums it all up and brings it together and just says, this is the reality that we're in. So, so why don't you pray with me, please, uh, and then we will jump into it. So, Father, we come before you this morning uh, thankful that you are worthy of our time, of our thoughts, of our total being. Uh, and yet, as we will look today, apart from you, we don't give you our thoughts and our time and our, our actions, our, our, our total being. Our, our words are corrupt. and um, It's just a reality that that was sin in our life, and apart from you, it is a dark, dark place. Thank God there is hope, and there is hope in Jesus, and we're thankful. And God, you tell us that your word is powerful, that your word is good for doctrine, for 
correction, for, for instruction in righteousness. Um, and so, God, I pray that today that we will be instructed by your word. And certainly, God, even as putting this together this week, I've become so much more aware of my own sinfulness, my own inability on, on my own to live the life that you have called me to. And so with that as reality, God, I want, I'm asking you to teach us today. Certainly my words are hollow unless they come from you. So teach us, convict us, draw us closer to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you, in your bulletin, there is a set of notes in there that you can uh, jot down some things and hopefully we'll try and uh, get you so you can fill in some of those blanks that are there. Um, but no, or somebody, can you get us to one of the next slides, please? But, um, you know, I really think that if we don't have the historical context as to why Paul wrote this book, that we'll be missing out a little bit on understanding what it is they wrote and why that he wrote in the way that he wrote it. Um, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but I just think it's important that we go back and just remember this context of it. So if you recall, the book of Romans, Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And, and though we don't have many details as to how it started, that church, it's understood uh, that it began after the events of Pentecost that are mentioned there in Acts chapter 2. Um, and at that event, where Jews from Rome were visiting Jerusalem, they witnessed what the Holy Spirit was doing on that day. And those Roman Jews put their trust, their faith in Christ, and they took that back with them to Rome. And started the church there. And that church began to grow amongst the Jewish community there. And then it also grew by bringing in Roman Gentiles into the church. And those Roman Gentiles putting their faith in Christ. Um, but you got to remember a little bit that the early church was just, you know, it looked like a, a sect of Judaism where they still were practicing, doing a lot of their religious practices that they did before coming to Christ. As, as they were growing and learning and understanding what it meant to become a Christian, they were still doing all of the things that a good Jew would do, but now they just had their faith in Christ. And so, of course, that meant that they were abiding by the dietary laws, and they were uh, trying to obey the law, the Ten Commandments, and, and everything in the Torah. They even uh, did the things like circumcision and other uh, Jewish practices uh, that would show that they were faithful to the Lord, that they trusted the Lord. But of course now really the main difference was that they had put their faith and their hope and their trust in Christ. So that's how the church in Rome began. But then in the 40s, the early 40s, the, not the 1940s, but the early 40s, the, the 40s, most likely around 49 AD, uh, the Jews, including the Christian Jews, were all kicked out of Rome by the Emperor Claudius. And so for a period of about five years or so, uh, the Roman church was dominated by Gentile Christians. The Jews were gone, the Gentiles were there. And so when the church completely changes in its, its makeup, the church is going to look a little different, right? And so for, uh, like I said, about a period of about five years where that church was dominated by the, the Gentile Christians, um, things changed. Of course, some of those Gentile Christians were religious men, uh, they're what Luke calls God-fearing Greeks or God-fearing Gentiles. Um, but other Gentiles, other people who came into the church, 
were people who got saved from their heathen pagan backgrounds, their really sinful backgrounds. Um, so when the Jews finally came back from their exile out of Rome, um, and they were allowed to go back into the city, uh, the Jewish Christians came back into those churches and noticed that things had changed quite a bit. You know, imagine if you were gone from here for a long period of time and came back and you saw the difference. I mean, our church is different just from what we were five years ago. Imagine if, I don't know, I, I can't think of anything in comparison, but just imagine that change of that. So they came back and they found a difference. And so imagine the conversation that was going on in, in the church when they, the Jewish Christians came back, like, no, wait, wait a second. You can't be eating that. That's not what a good religious person would do. And those Gentiles are like, but hey, I like my bacon. What do you mean I can't be eating that? You know, or they're like, wait, you're, you're supposed to be getting circumcised. And the, the Gentiles are like, whoa, wait, we're supposed to be doing what? Excuse me? No, 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 no. And, and the Jews were like, you need to follow the law. And the Gentiles were saying, we're, we are free in Christ. And so because of this, because they are coming at this differently, that there was a lot of division that was started in the church, uh, that arose in the church. There was conflict within the church. So Paul hears about this, and he says, hang on, church. You need to be unified. And you need to be unified in Christ. Christ is what will make us unified. And so he writes this book of Romans. And in the first four chapters of the book, he's making the case that neither group really is all that. Uh, that both factions, both the Jews and the Gentiles in the church, apart from Christ, are guilty in God's eyes and need to be saved by the gospel. So they can't be saved by following the law or anything that they can do on their own. Only Jesus can make them righteous before God. And that is what will result in a unified, multi-ethnic family that God promised to Abraham way back in Genesis. And so that's really the historical context as to why Paul is writing this book. Um, so here we are in chapter 3, uh, coming to the end of his charge that apart from Christ, everybody is guilty in God's eyes. Um, and so, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the case that Paul has made in these first couple chapters. And then this big summary statement that he comes in right before he starts talking about what the gospel actually is. And so I can't get my slides. There they are. Thank you. But they're, they're back here. Well, there. Well, I went way far ahead because it's not changing back there. All right. So thank you. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So here we are. Paul is making his case. And like I said, so far, the first part of the letter starting with chapter 1, verse 16, all the way through chapter 3, verse 8, he is trying to show that people cannot get right with God apart from the gift of righteousness that God gives through faith in Jesus. So Paul is, is writing this kind of like a skilled lawyer making a case uh, before the court. And the first thing that Paul says is that he's not ashamed of the gospel. If you remember, uh, several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Greg talked about uh, these two verses. The key verses of this book is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. Um, so let me read that section. Um, and I know some of you have memorized it um, as we've been trying to do this as a church. Uh, but, but this really is the first part of the case that Paul is making. So in verse 16 it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it, is the, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, 
than to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So as he's making this case, uh, he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, at first here, he doesn't define what the gospel is. Um, Like I said, we'll get to that actually next week as we continue on in chapter 3. But what he does give is two reasons why he's not ashamed. And the first one is that the gospel is God's power to save people. And the second one is that it reveals God's plan to impart his righteousness to people. And of course, that raises the question, why does God need to impart or or transmit his righteousness to people? why, Why do we need the gospel to give us righteousness? And so Paul anticipates that question. He's like, all right, I'm glad you asked. Why, why do we need God to transmit, to impart his righteousness? And so the reason we need God's righteousness is because all humanity is unrighteous and deserves God's judgment. You know, as we heard from Pastor Will a few weeks ago, that we are all under God's wrath. That we, before Christ are deserving of judgment. And God's wrath is being made known against sin. And to make his point crystal clear that he means all humanity, Paul starts going into really what that means and what that looks like. He starts calling out different people groups. So first he says that the godless and the wicked That the Gentiles are obviously guilty. You know, those those pagan Gentiles that suppress the truth, they worship statues of men and of animals. Uh, They're sexually deviant people. They lie and they gossip and they don't obey, obey their parents and on and on and on. He makes the case at the end of chapter one that they, apart from Christ, are guilty. But before the the Jewish Christians can get out there, yeah, I knew it, I knew it, I I could tell that they were guilty. Paul like anticipates that and he says, you know what? I thought you were going to say that. So he goes on and, and goes and says that the moral and the righteous people, or the religious people, the moral and the religious people, you're guilty too. You say you're moral, but you can't even keep your own moral code. You hold people to a standard, and it's a standard that you don't even keep yourself. You try to obey the law of God, but you don't. You judge people when they lie and steal, and you lie and steal too. You perform religious duties like circumcision, but it's meaningless because your heart is far from God. So at the beginning of chapter 3, he anticipates their next question. Uh, He anticipates the next question that those Jewish Christians would ask and say, well, is there any benefit in being a Jew? And of course he says the answer is, well, yeah, there's a benefit to being a Jew. The, The benefit is that God gave the Jews the law. Out of all the people groups in the world... God chose you, the Jewish people, to get the Torah, to get the law, to get the Ten Commandments direct from the hand of God. That the Jews have the word, the oracles of God. So there's a benefit to that. But the downside is that the law points out our unrighteousness. But it also points out God's faithfulness. And so that brings us to our passage today. That 
that everybody, everybody, apart from the gospel, everyone is guilty. And like I said, these 12 verses are a summary statement to show the all-inclusive nature of sin. These 12 verses really hit at the heart that everyone, apart from the gospel, is guilty. And so let's read this chapter together, uh, or at least these verses together, sorry, not the whole chapter. But would you mind standing with me as we read this? So the, the passage there, if, if looking up at the screen is too hard, are written there in your notes on the one side. Or you can follow along on the screen. But let's read it together. It says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Sorry. And in, in the way, they mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's eye by the slips of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Thank you. Let me be seated. How's that for a real positive passage to be studied today? All right? So, in this summary text here, Paul starts off asking a question. And he says, well, what conclusion should we come to based on the things that we just heard? So what conclusion should we come to? And so that brings to, to mind two questions. The first is, who is the we and what did they just hear? Well, what they just heard was earlier in, in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says the Jews have an advantage because they have the words of God. And they heard that God was faithful. All right, so what conclusion should they draw that they have this advantage of having the words of God? But then again, who's the we that Paul's talking about? And Paul here is identifying himself with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ that are there in Rome. As we know that Paul himself was a devout Jew. As it says in Philippians 3, that he was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, and as to the law, he was a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the churches, and as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. So the we here are, are he's responding to the Jews are saying, all right, so if we have this benefit and we have a law, like, sh what should we conclude based on that? What do we do with that information that, yes, there is an advantage to being a Jew? That there is an advantage to having the law of God? Does it lead us to the conclusion that we are better off than the other groups of people? That the Jews will somehow avoid God's wrath or judgment because they have the law? And Paul's answer is this emphatic no. 
not at all. Having the law does not make a person any better off than any other person. As the, the pastors, we were all studying this passage together uh, earlier this week, and uh, Pastor Will used this analogy uh, that I thought was pretty fitting. He said, it, it, it's like a juror carrying the verdict to the judge. You know, he's got it in an envelope and he's delivering it to the judge. And she's thinking, well, you know, I must have some little special advantage here because I'm the one delivering this message. And the judge reads the verdict that says that all people are guilty, including that person who delivered the message. That everyone's guilty. Delivering the words or having the words of the verdict in that envelope did not make the juror any more special. It didn't relieve them of their guilt. It didn't give them any special standing with the judge. They just had the words there, but it applied to them equally as much. And so Paul's answer is really, no, you're not in any better shape. In fact, it makes you more guilty. You had God's laws, and look how you responded. The Gentiles, as, as, as bad as they are, they didn't have the actual words of God in front of them. They had what was written on their hearts, but you, he made the point of giving you the, his words special, and you still kept on sitting. And then Paul goes into his, his, this little final summary statement of this section. And you can tell it's his final summary because he uses these words, as I've already charged. So as I've already said, and he's going to repeat himself, but in just a different manner. And so as he's already said, what is that charge he's already made? We've said it a couple of times already that both Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. And again, this is what he's been saying all the way from chapter 1, eight, verse 18, all the way through chapter 3, verse 8. That Jews and Gentiles are alike, are under the power of sin. So I want to take a moment just to, to look at that phrase, under the power of sin. If you're under something, what does that mean? That you're under it. Well, is that you're responsible you, you, to the authority, to the weight of, to the sway of, to the control of someone or something. And Paul's saying here that sin is not something that just merely scratches us on the surface. It's not that it has caused us to simply be broken. Although we do like to use that term that, that we are broken. And that it's true that we are broken because of sin. But it's not just that. It's not just something that affects us. It's something that bears down on us. It entangles us, as Hebrews 12.1 says. It's a yoke around our neck. And we are subject to the judgment and the condemnation that sin deserves. Paul will say later on in the book of Romans that we are slaves to sin. At Romans 8, 7, and 8, Paul says that sin makes us unable to submit to God uh, and that we cannot please him because of our sin. Yet, even though we're under it, the sinner willfully allows sin to have dominion in their life. How did sin become so powerful? I'm going to word this in a way that hopefully will give you some things to talk about in your small groups in the next uh, week or so to come. So, Because uh, you may not have heard it phrased or put this way before. But the power of sin is the law. Paul is clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that the power of sin 
its ability to bring death comes from the law. By the law, Paul is referring both to the law that Moses was given on Mount Sinai, uh, but it also is the, the nature of humanity uh, to rebel against God that revealed itself for the first time when Adam and Eve sinned against God's command in the garden. And as we studied last week, Jews were under the law, obviously, right? You know, they were given the laws of God. They were subject to it. That was the whole um, defining part of their religion is that they had the laws of God. It's given directly to them. But the Gentiles, too, are under the law because the requirements of the law were written on their hearts. Look over at chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. So, Because it's there written on their hearts, they are both under the power of sin under the law and the consequences that it brings because neither are able to keep the requirements of the law itself. And so, uh, so Paul there in this is like, all right, here's it. Everybody's guilty. Everybody is under the power of sin. And then he goes into a a little section where he's quoting the Old Testament to give weight to his argument of what it means that everybody is under it. And Paul quotes six different Old Testament sections to support his claim that Jews and Gentiles are under the power of sin. And these six passages, these six quotes, cut to the heart of everyone's guilt before God. And he gives the proof in three different ways. That they are guilty by their nature, they're guilty by their words, and they're guilty by their conduct. So let's look at the first one real quick. It says that they're guilty by their nature. That there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Uh, These verses point to the universal nature of sin. I mean, look at those words. No one, not even one, no one, no one, all, no one, not even one. You know, there's no exceptions here. I mean, I never use superlatives when I speak. And I always say exactly what I mean, right? right? Nobody likes it when people use superlatives because usually when they say it, they don't really mean, well, you, you, what do you mean I always do that? I don't always do that. I'm not doing that right now, right? Nobody, any married people ever have that argument at home? Um, okay, just me. Um, But here, God's using the superlatives of no one and all. And he's, in those things, he's echoing the points that are made in his his earlier charge in chapter 1. And then he's echoing the thoughts of people who are suppressing God in uh, chapter 1, verse 20 as well. I try to come up with a... A little acronym for all these different things that he points out just in these first couple verses. Um, so I came up with floors. Uh, hopefully that'll help you remember that you know we're all on the floor or something because of our sin. I don't know. 
Um, but in 10, 11, and 12, he's quoting from Psalm 14, um, which is pretty much the same as Psalm 53. And then he's quoting from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He's saying that there's no one righteous. Uh, that, you know, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. And, and that there's nobody who is righteous. Nobody who is right standing before God. There's no one who understands. They don't understand God. They don't understand the law. They don't understand their own sin. They don't understand how to deal with their sin. It's just not there. No one who seeks God. It's not just that they don't understand. They are content in their ignorance. They don't seek or try to understand. They don't pursue God and look for him. And in fact, they rebelliously refuse to seek God. Or there's a willful distortion of what is known about God. You know, all have turned away. Those are the people who have opposed the God, who are opposed to God. They have turned their backs on him. I hate it when I'm in a conversation with, all right, a heated conversation maybe, where I might be having a, a conversation and the person is not listening, right? They're, they're just ignoring me. And, you know, I was guilty of this the other day. Emily was telling me something and I was just continuing to work on my computer and that bothered her. Understandably so, Right? It would be a complete other thing if she was, and a worse thing, I would say, if she was talking to me, and not only was I just not ignoring her, I just stood up and walked out of the room. I can imagine the heat I would have taken had I ever done something like that. Okay, I've done stuff like that. And we do that to God. They become worthless. They become rotten to the core. It's not that you have no value in God or in God's eyes, but that because of our sin, that we are rotted from the inside out. And no one who does good, they're just sinful. And it doesn't mean that man can't do good things, but it's good without God. Doing good here is more than just being kind to somebody, and it, it would imply good that is perfectly done truth as an act of worship. And we are unable to do good perfectly. There is a temporary good and there is an eternal good. But we only seem to care about the temporary. While God looks at the eternal. And so all of us, apart from Christ, everyone was like this. I find it interesting that most of us can easily admit, hmm, I'm not perfect, right? I have a few flaws here and there. But I don't think any of us would have the audacity to insist that they are without flaws whatsoever. But saying that I'm without flaws is a far cry from admitting that we are utterly depraved and lacking the ability to please God in any way. You know, we might say, well, I'm not perfect, right? I, I can agree with that. But I'm not righteous? I mean, I mean, I, I, I got to have some right standing with God. God loves me, right? So I, I'm not unrighteous. I, I'm just not perfect. Or we will admit, well, I, I lack understanding in things. There are things that I don't know about God, or there are things that I don't get. But nobody wants to admit that they have no spiritual understanding apart from Christ, and apart from the Holy Spirit. We all might say, yeah, sure, I've, I've wandered off the path now and again. You know, I've, I've, I've veered from the right path. I haven't turned away from God. 
You know, actually, sometimes I feel like God's kind of turned his back on me. Like, but these, these passages are, are saying the complete opposite. Like, this is what we have done. We are unrighteous. We have no spiritual understanding. We have walked away. We have turned our back on God. And that was our state before coming to Christ. And so the, second, the first proof there is that they are guilty by their nature. The second proof of their guilt is that they're guilty by their words. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouth are full of cursing and bitterness. And here, Paul's quoting from Psalm 5 and Psalm 140 and Psalm 10. The throat, the tongue, the lips, the mouth. You know, the open graves invokes imagery of death and decay. Through the use of the tongue, we're able to see the rot that is going on beneath the surface that is in our hearts. You know, Matthew 12, we can read that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Deceit and lies. You know, we use our tongues both to deceive in order to do harm, or we can use our tongues in order to hide the deceit and the harm that we've already done. And that vivid imagery of the poison of vipers is on their lips. What a graphic way to convey the pain and suffering that we can inflict on others with our words. You know, the lies and the poison of things that move us away from God. I mean, this is, this is what you're going to get in our culture. You know, the poison of your, your best life now. The poison of God helps those who help themselves. It's a self-help thing. The poison of, well, you can save yourself. Like, you are your own authority. It's that poison that God's plan for your life is not the best. You get to choose. You get to choose your own path, your own sexual identity, your own standard. And in the end... It leads to, to death. And then that use of the cursing. It's an expression of the actual way in which people tend to speak, right? I, I don't understand why they're, you watch a comedian or something and they have to drop F-bomb every other word. It's like, are you that unintelligent? That's the only word you can come up with? I mean, but... It's the crassness and the vulgarity and the violence that comes out of people's mouth. And it's really not just the, the world and the comedians. It, it, that happens even sometimes by those of us who claim to be a part of Christ. Our sinful nature draws out our own crassness. And the bitterness is an expression that reflects the condition of their heart. And out of the bitterness of the heart flows the cursings of the mouth. You know, we feel like we've been wronged by God. We feel like that, that, that we are not getting what we deserved, and so it's reflected in our words. And the third part, the third proof of their guilt is that it comes out in their conduct. Their feet are quick to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. Again, he's quoting here in Isaiah 59 and Psalm 36. It's their feet. It's their paths. They're indicating, indicating the path that they are on. That you know, leads to misery and death. Quick to shed blood. Maybe it's not their other people's blood that they're quick to shed. But maybe it's their own. It's their own self-destruction. 
through drugs or alcohol or, or through self-mutilation, through chasing after pornography and other things that, that are destructive in their own heart. In their eyes, there's no fear of God in their eyes. It is both the root of the problem for sin and a great sin in and of itself. And that goes back to chapter 1, verse 20, how we suppress the knowledge of God. When there's no fear of God, their filter is removed. There's no deterrent, and God is held in contempt. You know, I just thought it was interesting, you know, talking about how, you know, feet quick to shed blood. Pastor Well, a couple weeks ago, read a quote from the Speaker of the House saying how it was a sin to not be able to provide abortion to people. We got a whole culture who are quick to shed blood over that uh, particular issue. And so you get the mouth you get the feet and the eyes, this reported, repeated references to bodily parts of this section shows that Paul sees sin as an expression of expressing itself through the entire body. And it's what a lot of theologians will call total depravity. It's not that the sinner is as bad as he can be, because we can always be worse. It's that the sinner is as bad off as he will ever be. And his entire being is adversely affected by sin. Uh, The Christian writer J.I. Packer uh, wrote that total depravity signifies a corruption of our moral and spiritual nature that is total not in degree For as no one as bad as he might be, but in extent. Total depravity declares that no part of us is untouched by sin, and therefore no action of ours is as good as it should be. Gosh, and I'm I'm out of time here, but I'm going to go quickly in those last two verses of the section. It says, to those under the law, that everyone... That every mouth may be silent, and that the whole world is accountable to God. We cannot become righteous by observing the law. We're going to fall. We're going to fail. We're going to sin. So this is for us here in the church. Like We cannot gain God's approval by being here on a Sunday morning. That was never the intent for us to come together and be good and do religious things. It doesn't matter how much you give. It doesn't matter how many good things you do. It doesn't matter what retreats you go to. It doesn't matter how many perspective classes you go to. As my pastor used to say when I was a kid growing up, it doesn't matter if you were born on a Sunday morning in the front row of the church. Those things will not earn you favor with God. The thing is, having God's words, rather than making us special, as it says here at the, the very last bit, having God's words makes us conscious of our sin. Being here and reading God's word should make us say, Oh my gosh, I can't do this. I don't have a righteousness. I need God's righteousness. I need him to give me his righteousness. Yet we often try and do it on our own. Well, and that's where that last part of God's standard kind of set, set, steps in. And so we're going to talk about the good news of the gospel next week. 
if we stopped right here at this point that we're all guilty, eh, who would want it? Like, yeah, what a bummer. Let's come to church and find out how bad we are. Because that's our reality. Again, apart from Christ, that's our reality. But there is a hope in Jesus. We're never going to get God's standard of perfection. Externals will not make us righteous. Only Jesus can make us righteous. If the power of sin that brings death is the law, then the power of God that brings salvation is the gospel. And the gospel says that we are unrighteous. But Jesus gives us his righteousness. The Bible says that because of our sin, we deserve judgment. We deserve death. But the gospel says that Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin and to give us new life. To give us his righteousness. And so while we're going to talk about this more in the, in the coming weeks, there may be somebody here who has never done that and you can't wait till next week to deal with it. We are not promised another breath. You are not guaranteed being here next week to hear it. So I would encourage you, if you've never given your life to Christ, maybe you've sat in these, well, they're not pews, but if you've sat in these folding chairs week after week after week, and you've thought that just, being here and doing the Christian thing is going to save you. It's not. Come find me or Pastor Greg or Pastor Van or Pastor Will or somebody. Somebody. It doesn't have to be a pastor. Find somebody here in this church who will take you to Jesus. You can get your life right before him. And he will make your life right. So pray with me as we come up and close with this last song. And God, as I put this sermon together, I recognize that my own sin, how weighty and how heavy it is, and I wouldn't want to carry it. I can't carry it. God, we thank you for Jesus who has taken our sin upon himself. that you're giving us your righteousness because my own is no good. My righteousness is as filthy rags. And so while all of us in this room are no better off than any other person, we're all guilty. God, we thank you that, that you've given us your son. And so God, help us this week as we go forth To not put our trust in our works and in our deeds, but to put our trust in you. So God, we thank you and we pray this in the name of Jesus.